This video was recorded in front of a live virtual audience. Hello everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fashion Bunker. Today we're going to be talking about a very particular topic that I think has never been really touched upon on YouTube before, and that is perfumes to wear for funerals. Now, uh, in the moment in which this video is being filmed, it is the week in which uh, the world has lost Prince Philip uh, and uh, also DMX, but uh, well, on different levels, people die all the time, but this is a particular week. So I thought it would be interesting to touch base on this uh, topic and uh, debate and discuss uh, perfumes to wear for funerals. To do so, I thought, who else best to call into the Fashion Bunker and debate this topic, in particular because we're connected also to Prince Philip, than one of the most avid and intellectual and huge lovers of perfumes, who, who better than Rich Mitch. Rich Mitch, are you with us, darling? Hey, hey, Rich, welcome. <laughs> we got Rich in the fashion bunker, you guys. Let me move to the side so we are ah, there. You go. This is the infamous Rich Mitch rubber ducky. You know Rich Mitch from the chats. He's on every perfume community, uh, whether it be YouTube channels in the comments, reviews. You know Rich Mitch knows his perfumes. And Rich Mitch also knows a little bit about Great Britain, right? <laughs> Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Guys, before we get to our topic and before we start discussing this, might I remind you, if you like my channel and my content, uh, push that subscription button. Be, you know, Become a subscriber or subscribe to my channel today. You can also push the join button next to the subscription button and become a member. Gain access to extra perks. You can also join me on Patreon. Super Deco Ball spelled together there as well to gain access to extra perks as well. This video is being filmed live, so we have our live co-chatters in the chat section as well. Thank you guys so much for chatting with us. And uh, thumb up this video if you're liking it thus far. Where I'm going to get back to the thumbing up the video at the end of the video as well, because like, show YouTube algorithm that we are where it's at. Rich Mitch, my dear, thank you so much for coming to the Fashion Bunker. Thanks for having us. So... You were telling me, remember we were talking a couple of weeks ago about Prince Philip and then he was rushed to the hospital and then you broke the news in the live stream. You said like, hey, he's in the hospital. Is he dead? Is he not dead? And then we were like, we don't know. But then he survived. And now, alas, he is dead. He is. He is. So <laughs> you told me. You, you, <laughs> what? Is he? But he is. Hopefully. Maybe. Hopefully, maybe. But so oh, well, if he's going to be dead, let's hope he is actually fully dead and not just like half dead, like I tried to kill him the last time. Oh my God. Um, I prematurely announced that he was dead last time. Um, what happened was, I've got a friend. I've got a friend who used to be in the Queen's Guards, um, and the Queen's Guards are the people who stand outside the palace and aren't allowed to talk to you, sort of thing. You know, the ones who just have to stand there while people like talk to them and they get the pictures taken with them. Yeah, with the huge hats. Yes, with the huge hats. That's right. It used to be one of them. And what happened was that week. Wait, you uh, used to the... be one of them? No, no, my friend used ah, to be one of them. Okay, okay. I did used to be one of them. Um,. So my friend used to be one of them. It's been a while since he was in there, but um, he still talks to like some of the some of the guards that are still there. And what happened was, they've got um, they've got like um, they get put on alert for when something like big's going to happen like this. And um, the term for it was is that they were going to be. Um, it's called the fourth bridge is down. Um, the fourth bridge is a bridge in Scotland, and it's the code for. Um, it's the code for when Prince Philip was going to die for the protocol to go into place. And they were put on alert that the fourth bridge might be about to go down. Um, my friend who used to be a Queen's guard was told because obviously they're still friends and the gossip because men are worse gossipers than men than women. Sorry. Um, and what happened was he was, he was obviously just like told that they were like, would think Prince Philip's like, like he's going into hospital, he's not coming out. Like there's a chance he might die tonight. And apparently he was gravely ill. Um, he had to have a he had to have a minor 
uh, operation on his heart. I think he had a stent put in. Um, and what happened is he survived. Um, so I felt like a bit of a tit, to be honest with you. So apologies about, about telling you someone was dead when they weren't. Um, and so they were put on this high alert and they were like, look, he's not going to live much longer. Um, he's not a well man. So like they've been on high alert for like ever since he went into hospital that week. Um, and the protocol for Prince Philip was called the fourth bridge is down. And the fourth bridge is a bridge in Scotland. The protocol for the queen is London bridge is down. And that really will be big. Um, the, the well, why, why do they in. have to have these names for, why don't they just say the queen is dead? Um, that's the name of an album by the Smiths. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe that maybe they said the queen was dead. It, it's all very pantomime. Um, it's really all that the it's really all that the the royal family's got left. Um, is pantomime and pomp and circumstance. They don't have any real sort of power. Um, not any power they can use anyway. It's it's very it's very peculiar how our because our we've never had a revolution in this country. We've only ever had evolution rather than revolution. So all these all these quirks and really strange little things are relics of a bygone era. Um, it's also illegal. It was illegal anyway to discuss the death of the monarch up until a couple of, like like a hundred two hundred years ago, um, because discussing the death of the monarch was tantamount to treason. Because if you discuss the death of the monarch. It meant that you could be plotting against the monarch. So, like, like from the from like the twelve hundreds, the thirteen hundreds, the fourteen hundreds, it was it was if you said that you were you were on the hook for for um, treason for treason. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so you so, so basically, so, they had to invent other ways of meaning it without saying it. So the London that, Bridge is that, down. It's like saying she dead, but I'm not saying she's dead because it would be illegal to say it. So that's kind of the reason. That's, that's where, that's the culture. That's the culture you're coming from. Yes, exactly. Um, these protocols have code names, um, and the, all this sort of inferred stuff. We're a very strange society in that everything with in America, it's much easier to have things out face to face and just say what you feel and say what you mean in Britain. We skirt around things. Um, I think part of it's because we're an island people, hmm. and very we're, we're very strange like that, as most island people are. Yes, and you're not very open to strangers and foreigners. <laughs> like, no, that's quite right. Yeah, that's, you're you're very right. It's a it's very similar in Japan as well. Yes, very very similar. I have very dear friends with Japanese heritage and roots, uh, and they also always tell me they say Jacob. We are a messy, messy folk <laughs> when it comes to accepting foreigners uh, and um, very difficult. Yeah. Hmm. That's right. Well, now we can say, uh, since the royal family officially said it, that uh, he passed away, I think uh, we can also say it, right? Yes. It's, it's official. That's I mean. right. It is official. That's what I was trying to get at before. Hmm. Um, it's 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 been put on the gates of Buckingham Palace, so that's how you know it's official. They put the they put the um, the announcement on the gates of Buckingham Palace hmm. to confirm it because uh, Mi- the Queen doesn't doesn't lower herself to talk to like the newspaper herself. No, of course. Uh, Mister Philip Fabulous says this gives "Long Live the Queen" a whole new meaning. <laughs> yes. Yes, she will. She'll, she'll be around for another 15, 15 years at least. And Lord Charfield says that's not a fair assessment of the UK. I'll say this. It's, it's getting better. Um, we had, we had a lot of, a lot of like immigration um, in a good way that changed up because islands can get stale, I believe. Um, and it's, and it's, it's brought in a lot of new culture and it's changed our culture. There's a bit of back, like, like there's a lot of populism going on at the minute. There's a bit of, there's a bit of like backfire against it. Um, but that'll wane, um, because what we do is we're the ultimate assimilators. The will, like these people will come round to like, they will come round to like 
British values. Um, yeah, the populism is an issue. Uh, sorry for interrupting you. Yes. Yeah, right. No, yeah. no, I just wanted to say populism is an issue, but I think since, you know, Trump is gone, I have the feeling things are getting maybe a little bit better because the rest of the world usually follows suit, you know? Yeah. I kind of, yeah. I don't want to say America rules the world, but you, you kind of, you see it always mirrors. It always reflects upon what happens in the States. Um, yeah. But, but on another note, what is going on with Boris Johnson's hair? It gets worse and worse. <laughs> <laughs> Disgraceful. It's absolutely disgraceful that he won't brush his hair. Um, does he, he think that up. he... No, but wait, but just like all you know, jokes aside, does he really think that by doing that messy surfer look that he looks younger that way? Is that his shtick? He's bald. That's the, that's the thing that it's... And he can't handle it like a lot of people who, who, who lie. Um, he couldn't just accept the fact that he was going bald, so he had to shave it off. He didn't shave it off. He um, he just he just co- it's like a comb over without being a comb over. It looks like like it looks like a bird nested in his head, farted, flew away, and then something exploded. <laughs> That's right, farted a bomb, like a little egg bomb. Yeah, it's like the rich Mitch rubber ducky that we have here on the in the video right now. It's like rubber ducky left Boris and. It left something. <laughs> it did something happened. That's right. Oh man. The wind changed. The wind changed and his hair stayed like that. It's it's hilarious. I just I can't take a person seriously when I see that. I mean, listen, we're so quick to judge people's appearances and that's terrible. We shouldn't, you know, we should know better. Political correct times, blah blah blah. But like I'm like, dude, like you're literally the prime minister. Yes. Like literally. Like fix that hair. <laughs> Yes, his buddy's communication secretary is uh, became his mistress, and now they're getting married. And she's a she's like she's like thirty two, thirty three. She's called Carrie Simmons. And you would think, as a communication secretary, she would be able to like talk to him or like get a hairstylist or. Um, well, I guess something. all I guess all her communicating was done underneath the sheets. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Listen, we got comments. You know, Audrey's in the house. Aisha is here too. Uh, Mr. Phillips says, we need Boris Johnson's hairdresser to come live and spill the tea. (laughs) (laughs) Audrey says, I don't know. I fell out with some friends because of Brexit. It's it's happened. Um, it It was a hot topic. It was something everybody was talking about. Um, it was one politics was very dull for a long time, and then the last ten years, the last six years, it's been on fire. Um, and it's like there's no in between. Um, and that's that's just what that's just. I think that's the state the world's in at the minute, though. What um, I mean, does, do you want to share with us what your opinion on of Brexit is? Are you pro Brexit or not? I voted. I voted to remain. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was pretty remain. I don't like some of the things that have happened since Brexit. Yeah. But I, I, like on be, on behalf of like both the British and the EU. Yeah. But but I think the way that the pandemic's panned out, I think some of the things that some of the European leaders have done um, haven't been haven't been very good. Um, such as the such as the vaccine rollout. I don't know how. I don't know how. Um, how familiar you are with the, with the vaccine rollout? We've populated Nelly. We've populated every vulnerable adult in the country, and now we're populating people who aren't at risk of dying, mm-hmm. like the people who like the thirties and the forties. We've started on those. Um, I got my vaccine because I'm vulnerable. Um, I'm on immunosuppressant, so I've had to. I've had. I had to have it early. Yeah. Um, our vaccine rollout has been amazing. It's been like second to Israel, and Israel's like Israel's nearly populated their entire country. But Israel, um, aren't they doing? They're not doing the vaccine. They're doing some other thing. Uh, they're not doing the. They have a different type of. Um, what are they doing? A different technique. They're using something else. They're not doing uh, like the double vaccine. I don't know what's it called, but anyway, they did something else. I have to. I would have to Google it again. Um, 
But I think a difficult topic, you know, with the vaccinations and everything, because I think, you know, one of the big reasons there's this whole big issue with AstraZeneca, which is the Oxford uh, one that you guys uh, basically have or developed, is that it's, it's kind of patent free. And I think a lot of the companies that develop the other vaccines, they don't want to have a patent free. Uh, so I think like they're kind of bashing it and trying to make it sound like it's a bad vaccine because we all know how capitalism works. So I'm not so sure, you know, I well, have I the, had fe- the, the AstraZeneca and I'm, I'm fine. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, if anything was going to happen, believe us, it would have happened to me because that's just my luck. Um, so if you get offered the AstraZeneca, I would recommend that you took it. Okay, but, uh, you're, but, but you're not going to discuss with us your third and fourth leg that just grew out because of the vaccine. No, no, my, my third leg's big enough. <laughs> you had that one before the vaccine already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, Rich, this is just one of the many reasons we all love you so much. And everybody in the chat is so happy that you're there. Um, you got a great sense of humor. Uh, you you were also for the unity that Europe stays together. I mean, it's it's all great. So and you love perfumes. And speaking of like the death of the prince, now you know Rich Mitch and I were discussing what topic to do together, and we thought, hey, what perfumes would we recommend you wear at a funeral? So Rich Mitch, I mean, which one? Can tell me your first one. I don't know how many you chose, but do you have which one would be your like number one or whatever? Which would be the first of your list? Which one would you wear? To a funeral, and also, what type of funeral? Like family member, or just a friend, or like one of these huge, massive population funerals where you know, like a prince dies, and then the whole country goes to pay their respect. What would be the yeah. perfume? If I was in the nobility and I was feeling cute, and I thought I was going to be clever, and I wanted to pay tribute to Prince Philip, who was exiled when he was born. He was born on Corfu. And he was the prince of Greece. Um, in this country, he gets called Phil the Greek, or he got called Phil the Greek, um, because he was the son of a Danish queen and a Greek king. And in the twenties, at that time, after the First World War, and Europe was obviously up its own backside at the time. Um, everything, including Britain, everybody was everybody was all over the place. Um, and he was an exiled no he was exiled nobility and it was the nineteen twenties and he was poor, he was poverty stricken until basically married the Queen. Um he couldn't afford his school fees. his family couldn't afford his school fees, so he had to go to a school that was sponsored by a relative. Um they he had he was an aristocrat, but at the time, obviously, after the Russian Revolution and like the rise of communism in different parts of the world, um, he was basically on the run. He went to live in France. He went to live in Germany. He lived in England. Obviously, he, he like he got together with the Queen. Um, so, in that regard, and since it was released in the nineteen twenties, one of the first ones I would, if I was going to go to his funeral, one of the first ones I would wear would be Queer de Russe. Chanel, Claire de Russie, because Claire, because Claire de Russie is a perfume about the smell of, is the perfume a, the smell of the boots of a exiled noble from Russia. Hmm. If, if you remember such, I can't remember. It was the it was a, it was a count or the duke that was Chanel's lover, and it was made to smell like his his uh, Russian leather boots. And it came out in the 1920s. 1926. And, yeah, 1926. It was Ernst Bode. That was five years after the Duke was born. Um, and I thought that would be quite a good one. I've also got another one from Chanel, which sort of ties into it. Which I'm just showing it now into the camera, um, if, if it focuses. Okay. Here's Queer de Russie for you guys. Um, okay, so this one for a funeral. To go to Prince Philip's, to go to Prince Philip's funeral, yeah? To go to Prince Philip's funeral. Queer de Russie, you guys. Okay, that's Rich Mitch's suggestion. Okay, moving on. <laughs> go on. What, would you like to do my next one or your next one? No, no, no. Do your next one. Unless you have something more to say about Queer de Russie. No, I was just going to say, I thought, I, 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 felt like a, I felt like there was a few, a few uh, synchronicities there. 
Yeah. A few things are tied in together with it being exiled nobility and in the 1920s with it being quite classy. Um, and it would have been the, re- the original release as well because um, I imagine people in the royal family have got access to the to the original Chanel's. Um, so yes, the next one I would choose would be number five because it was the it was the same year he was born. Um, he would have been a hundred and two months time. Uh, the same way that Chanel number five would be a hundred and two. No, months I thought he time. was born in like June or July. Well, I'm not sure. I think it's. I'll, I'll give give us two seconds. I'll have a look. I think he was like yeah June or July baby, and uh, number five is a May baby but we got correct i got corrected Cuit de Russie released in 1924 not 1926 says justin oh dear olfactive story says i like Cuit de Russie. um but isn't Cuit de Russie more like uh the the smell of the flappers <laughs> back then the flappers were loving Cuit de Russie. but it's very fascinating that you would wear Cuit de Russie to a funeral i totally see it i i totally see that vision happening for a funeral yeah, it's because it's got that birch tar as well. It's got, plus, it's got like a since it was based on like the you know like the boots and like the military standing. He was he was he was also in the military. Yeah, uh, he was a boat commander, um, and I've got a perfect that comes up with that sort of uh, that sort of thing later. Um, Antigone says, but, "Very thoughtful choice, bravo." You no, know, bravo. Thank you. Antigone says bravo. And Olfactive Story says, I would wear Royal Vintage by Mikhailev. Oh, well, I've never smelled it. I, have ne- I haven't either. Let me tell you my... So we crossed over because you guys, Rich Mitch and I did not um, tell each other which perfumes we chose. This is the first time I'm hearing his selection and it's the first time he's going to hear my selection. And we crossed over one perfume already because in my list, number five also makes the list. Um... The pure perfume, in my case, I would wear it. And I'm telling you the reason why, number five. Uh, I know number five so well for so many years, most of my life, really. And um, I've known it unattached to any particular good or bad experience. So this means that for me, this perfume uh, is not tainted because it's been in my life for so long. You know how we have some perfumes particularly seasonal perfumes that are just released or whatever. And then you kind of like it, you're infatuated with the smell, and then maybe you start dating someone, shit goes down, stuff goes wrong. And then you always associate that smell to that bad moment in time. And um, I was thinking a funeral might be a potential hazardous terrain or, you know, land or space, mental space where, if I were to wear a perfume that I've never really worn much before, that perfume might then become too much associated in my mind with that funeral. So I chose number five because number five is so rooted within me. Nothing can move it away. You know, that no experience could ever give me a bad memory of number five, not even a funeral, because number five is already so rooted within me. So I thought it's a very neutral base it's like one of those perfumes that will not get tainted by the negative experience. Let's say the funeral is for a loved one, family member, what have you, that is already very traumatic for me. Uh, wearing number five would not make number five smell of the death of a relative, you know, because number five already smells of so many other things in my life that it cannot get tainted. But also Chanel number five, the pure perfume, because it stays very close to the skin. It's a very, 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 the pure perfume. It's very, very, very noble that way. So it's not something that overpowers everybody else in the room in during the funeral, but it's something that stays close to me. And whoever wants to hug me and pay their condolences and their respect, or if I want to pay my respect to somebody else, and if I come really close to them to hug them or give them a kiss, then I leave just a little trace of something that smells of this delicious ylang ylang and jasmine that gives a little bit of a smell of hope. This is my idea. So if I do come close to somebody, I leave them with a with a smell of something good. So even if it's a bad moment, it gives them the opportunity to just snap out of it for a second. Even if just for a fragment of a second, this perfume allows you in the pure perfume form to lighten your weight, your psychological weight, your burden, even if just for a fraction of a second. Anyway, that's my reasoning. Sorry for blabbering on. Let's let's hear your next no. one. <laughs> okay. Well, I 
was going to go for number five as well. That was released in 1921, which was the same year that um, Philip was born. And it, it, Philip was born in June the 10th. So it was like a month and a a month and a week, like five weeks after that. I thought that's close. And over, a bit, over 100 years, you know, I thought that's, that's close enough. That might as well be the same age. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I thought number five, plus number five's got a lot of florals in it and funerals with the flowers. And I thought it could invoke that sort of, that sort of, because flowers, flowers are used at funerals, especially in Dalek flowers are used at funerals, to like the jasmine. Lilies. Yeah, lilies and jasmine. And they're used at funerals because back in the olden days, um, it was to cover up the stench of death and decay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I thought, like number five's got that, but number five's by no means a dead perfume. It, it's sort of, it's got that, it's got that, it straddles that, like the two realms quite well. I feel, yeah. Um, in down and up, it's a very, I don't want to say ubiquitous perfume, but I agree with you when you say there's hardly anything, there's hardly any experience I could have when wearing number five that could make me think any less or more of it. Mm. It's sort of, it's it's very, it's very in itself. It's yes. very odd of itself as well. It's so it's got it's it's put in a hundred years, and after a hundred years, it 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 it's qualified for, as its own thing. I I totally agree with you, and it's such a hermetic, abstract smell in its own right that yes. it doesn't allow you to define it. That's the magic of number five. It does not allow you to put it in a box. It 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 defies definition it really does and i know we talk about you know olivier paul's just uh, was interviewed by one of those bimbo actresses over there in france and he's she's like oh my god it's amazing to talk to you you know it's all this bullshit anyway and so she's like what is the magic of number five and he said it he's like oh we try to preserve the formula as much as we can to the original which of course they don't but he said it's the jasmine the jasmine of grass is what makes number five number five yeah, it totally makes sense. It totally makes sense. It's that jasmine and the aldehydes at the top, the, 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 the contrast between, because aldehydes smell like, they're supposed to smell like sunshine, and it's got the light of the day, and it's got the, the covering of the death, and then it's got the depth as well. It's got, it's in that old style French perfumery, which is now almost lost, hmm. in that it, it encompasses everything. It's a full wheel. And it turns, and it always turns, and it never stops turning, which means that at any one time it could be anything, but at the same time you could never def- – it could be everything and anything, but it's sort of like if you look at it, it changes immediately what it is. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing thing for a perfume. Um, I appreciate it more than I like it, if that makes sense, like objectively – it's it's one of the great perfumes ever, but personally, I'm not I'm not one to wear it very much because it's not really my style. But I can't deny it. It's that that's sort of like the difference between it and a lot of other perfumes. You can't you simply cannot deny Chanel Number no. Five because if if you do, it'll make a liar of you. Mm. Um, it's a beautiful, it's an amazing, beautiful thing. It, I, I, what can I tell you? I wear it a lot. I love it. But the pure perfume to me is where it's at. I love all the concentrations, really. You know, well, not all. I, I'm not a big fan of Au Premier, but um, but the pure perfume. Uh, you know, <laughs> they actually that's the only concentration where they really use uh the May Rose from Grasse and the Jasmine from Grasse. They don't have enough of their flowers to use them across the board for all of the concentrations, but only the pure perfume is gifted the gift of those flowers from Grass. So there's a different quality uh, to their raw materials that are utilized in the pure perfume of it. And let me tell you, there's nothing like it. There just isn't. And, and even if you respect it from a distance, you don't wear it. It's a smell you'll never forget once you've smelt it. it you know, it's... It's quintessential in its own right. It's like, it's, yeah, Chanel. Chanel have got um, Christopher Sheldrake as the master of their ingredients. There's a um, 
I'll send you a link to the to the YouTube. I don't know if you speak German, but it's in German, unfortunately. And unfortunately, I don't speak German. But there's a um, an hour long documentary about Chanel, and they do the um, they go into like the perfume. I think it's Chanel perfume sp- specifically, and they go into they do an interview with Christopher Sheldrick where he describes in 2005 he was appointed the master of their ingredients and he started planting iris and he started planting jasmine and he started planting all these fields and all this land that Chanel owned in the south of France mm. so that they could have their they could rely and have their own stock of their own flowers and guarantee it themselves every year <clears throat> excuse me and that's one of the reasons Chanel's and the Chanel reformulations hold up anyway because they've got long-term in-house perfumers. Yes. So if, reformula- if a reformulation happens, it's it's a li- like Jack Paul's for the last 30 years, 40 years, sorry, has reformulated his own previous formulations. So he's not coming into it as a stranger. He knows what needs to be tweaked. He knows how to fill in. Obviously, he's a highly skilled perfumer, as is Olivier Paul's. Um, I also agree with you when you say that Olivia Paul shouldn't be at Chanel. He doesn't need to be there just because his dad was there. It seems like a sentimental appointment. I don't think his style is Chanel. No, it's not at all. Um, yeah, it's not at all. No, I totally agree with you when you said that. Um, I think, but I he think did a master perfect. masterful job with Dior. Uh, yeah, back in two thousand five, and we see his power. He he has. He's a genius in many respects. He just is not the right fit for Coco. Sorry. No, I totally agree. <laughs> and what's I your totally next agree. one? What's your next choice? My next my next perfume, I don't know if you'll have heard of this one, but it is by a new niche brand founded by the creator of Fahrenheit, or one of the creators of Fahrenheit, mm-hmm. called Michel Almayrak. And it, the, the perfume house is called Polymois Parfums. Polymois de Parfum. Oh, like talk and to me about one, perfume. Yeah, talk to me about perfume, yeah. In French, parlez-moi de, de parfum, something like that. Talk to me about perfume. That's the brand? Yes, that's the brand. Mm-hmm. And it's made, and the perfumer is Michel Almarac, who did, what did he do? He did Fahrenheit. That's well, I have about. here in my little notebook, because I was reviewing a perfume last week, or was it two weeks ago? Oh, gosh, hold on a second. Um... Where's my list? I actually... Who was the perfumer? Yes. Yes, it is. Michel Almarac. He did Yop Femme. He also uh, created yes. Yop Femme in 1987. And he is also the nose of um, Fahrenheit from 1988. So just a year after Yop Femme, he did uh, Fahrenheit. It was a big, yeah. It was a big, it was a big hit in months, two years for him. Um... And this perfume, his brand is called Polymois de Parfum. Mm-hmm. And this release is called Oris Tattoo 29. Mm-hmm. And it is simply Oris. It's got very little else. And it's the amount of Oris is used and the quality of it. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's natural, but I imagine for the price it is because it's very expensive. It's 180 pounds for 100 mil. Mm. But it is... It's one of those perfumes where you want to turn up. If you want to turn up to a to a funeral and you want to be, you're trying to hide everything inside. I imagine a lot, like a lot of people would. Say, a lot of people used to say about the prince. Uh, this isn't necessarily to wear to his funeral, but this is like in any funeral. I would lend this to somebody to wear to a funeral. I think Iris is a very good, like an Iris centric perfume is very good for a funeral. And Oris is as well. Yes, yes. It's it's. It's cool, it's calm, it's together, it's not going to make a scene, it's very British, it's very it's very minimalist, it's very it's very but it's got a hint, it's got that hint of vulnerability about it. What is the because name of the perfume? It's called Oris Tattoo. O R R S I S and then Tattoo. Mm-hmm. I'll put it in the comments. Yeah, the Oris Tattoo. Interesting, um, I didn't think about this, but now that you've mentioned it, it totally makes sense to also add another perfume, uh, which I originally didn't add in my list, but now I'm going to add it talking to you. La Pausa by Chanel. Uh, and again, another Sheldrake slash Jacques creation. 
uh, the orris root and the iris in that one. Oh my God, it's so austere, detached, cold, yes. and it keeps everything within. Um, just like the aseptic, empty La Pausa Villa where Chanel, uh, you know, went to, uh, on holiday <laughs> with Churchill. But um, La Pausa could also be quite suited then for a funeral because it sounds very similar to the description of the Oris tattoo you're talking about. Yes, it's very La Pausa. That, that, that I think that um, the Chanel exclusives line. I think almost all of them have got Iris or Oris in. Um, or the the riff on that theme of of not detachment but like mm. I don't want to say disappointment but sort of like mm. bro- not broken dreams either but you know that sort of vibe oh that bitterness sort of, bitterness uh, yes like of a course. type of bitterness yes um like, yes like, like let down let down by the world like you had high hopes yeah. and you got somewhere and then you realised you looked at from the top of the mountain and you saw that the grass wasn't necessarily greener. From the top of the mountain, mixing me metaphors there, but you know what I mean. No, no, it's but that just... is definitely Chanel's life. That is Chanel's life. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, that La Pausa, that that line, I feel like riffs on that theme quite a lot mm. um, of loss, betrayal, um, struggle, um, injustice, um, misrepresentation, but not necessarily, but from herself, but from how she's misrepresented by other people, mm-hmm. um, and how outside influences she felt like she was buffeted by the wind quite a lot mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know and i feel like prince philip also had that sort of start in life um for the first 20 25 years of his life until he married the queen yeah so he was on shaky ground um his 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 future was not certain um but this parlemoire de parfum or his tattoo has that sort of has that sort of feeling of a funeral that you really don't want to go to because you don't want to make, and it's not because you don't want to go to it because you're below it. It's because because you're above it. It's because you feel as though you don't want to let anyone else down, and that you want to keep yourself together, and you don't want to upset other people. So, so it's almost as though you're going to a funeral with a secret, and you're going to bury the secret with that dead person. Oh, I um, love that visual. Oof. It's it's got if you can imagine if you can imagine somebody who wears sunglasses inside the church yeah somebody who's somebody who's wearing all black but and whose face doesn't move because it's rigid yes the whole way it's also it's also the perfume but it's very it's very watery as well um it's very so you can imagine tears before and after the funeral mm. um you can imagine like somebody being like it's a funeral that takes somebody a week to get over those two hours at the church. Um, it takes somebody a week in bed. Like it literally that, 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 that process of going to the funeral takes somebody so long to, to get over that it's got this stoic vibe, but it's also got a hit like an undertone of vulnerability. Yeah. And, And it's, it's, and the wateriness gives me tears. Um, it sort of, it sort of feels and smells like tears. Oh, um, that's my that's my third. That's my third. Perfect. So beautiful. I love when you say it feels. I mean, and smells of tears, like the feeling of because tears have a feeling. It's beautiful. Oh, you're a poet, Rich. Oh, you're giving <laughs> us you're giving us goosebumps. Audrey is commenting. She says, "What a beautiful visual, Rich." Going to a funeral with a secret. How moving. Rich is amazing at describing these perfumes, says Jack. I tell you what, these the way I've just described that is something I learned from you, actually. Um, I've been watching your perfume reviews for about five or six years and nobody reviews them. That What I've just said there is exactly the way that you would describe perfumes. You describe them in, in an emotional way. Yeah. You don't describe and, and you describe them as uh, yours is less technical and more emotional and it, that's how I that's how I began to feel about my perfumes. Um it became more than just a collection and a hobby. It's a way to like it's a way to express yourself. Um and sometimes it's a way to connect with yourself. Um because 
sometimes you can't say how you feel. Like I was talking here before, it's very hard for British. For me as a Brit, I don't know if other British people are like this, but for me, I find it very hard to express. Maybe it's just because I'm a bloke. I don't know. Maybe it's just all those things together. Um, but I feel that perfumes help me say something without talking. Yes. Oh, I, oh totally. Totally. But because yeah, perfumes are also funny. but perfumes are also keys to emotions, so they help you say something without talking. But once you put a perfume on, you start talking, and this is amazing. They just unlock words inside of you, and the more you deal with perfumes, and the more you realize perfumes, they don't just enhance your emotions and your mood at the at the moment, but they really unlock doors. Whether it be you know traveling into memories, but also into words and forming those emotions and explaining them to others. It's a wonderful exercise too, by the way, uh, because it, it really helps you connect with yourself. And ultimately, when you're more connected with yourself, you're a way more balanced person. You're much more easy to deal with. You know, you're less aggressive. You, um, you become just more embracing of other people as well, I feel. I mean, at least perfumes have helped me in that respect, but to each their own. Yes. Yeah. I feel that as well. I can be quite. I don't. Yes, aggressive is aggressive is part of that. Like very fiery. Yeah. Um, is 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 a good way to put it. I'm not. I'm not like. I'm certainly not violent by nature. But I, I could. I can feel myself. I can understand how people can lose their temper and, and things that help us express that. I think that's a young man thing as well. Not that I'm 35 now. I'm getting on, but. Like especially when you're a young man in your twenties and your late teens and you and you and you you're struggling to get things out and you're struggling to articulate. I feel like perfumes can help you do that because especially vintage ones because they are very articulate. They can say a lot of things very quickly. Yes. Oh and yes. They can say a lot of things very well. Um. And it's, it's, it's about taste. Your taste is about what you want to say. And as you grow older, your taste changes because you mature and you grow as a person. If you're still, if you're still the same person you were 15 years ago, there's probably something that needs to be worked out and resolved there. Yeah, there are knots there that need to be <laughs> yes, undone. And you got to work on get. yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and at a time like this, when there's funerals in the air, uh, bless DMX as well. He's he's dead. Not a not a not a perfect man, but who is? Um, he's passed away. Um, he brought a lot of joy to a lot of people. Um, and it's 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 when you realise that these big people die, it, it sort of makes you feel about your own mortality. Um, it, it makes you it, like it makes you realise that we do have a finite time. That's something else you do when you're young as well. You think, no, not it's not coming for me. Death's not coming for me. People like I'm a, I'm Superman. <clears throat> people don't die. Yeah. But people die. People do die, and it's 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 hard to grasp that. Yeah. I mean, uh, I have to say, first of all, thank you, from the bottom of my heart. I mean, I'm. I'm. You know, I'm also used to the camera, and I can control myself, so I'm not gonna cry. But what you said to me that you got inspired by my words for perfumes really means the world to me. Thank you so much, Rich. Like, well, thank you. Th no, thank you. But like you know, it, it, thank you, and also for saying it openly and publicly. Thank you so much. Thank you really a lot. No, no, it's not. Honestly, yeah. it's. It wouldn't say if it wasn't true, um, and I couldn't say it if it wasn't true. I'm not good at sucking up or or, <laughs> or anything like that. I can't do it. I'm much. No, yeah. I'm a easier to tear people down than build them up oh but, yeah me too <laughs> but it, yeah i've got no pro i've got no problem with telling somebody that that they've done something positive and good when they have yeah um yeah so thank it's, you it's honestly it's it's my it's my pleasure totally thank um, you thank you those reviews were was something completely alien to me the first time i saw one i was like what is this um, didn't know what was going on fully and it was what was it was it was he a the eau noir cologne or was he a bois d'argent eau de cologne i don't know which one moved you i don't know it was it wasn't it was it was a steady stream because i realized it was like it took us about two or three watching two or three of them to realize to like for it to start sinking in and that's when i sort of started like mature 
how I felt and get different connections to different perfumes. I now get rid, after a certain amount of time, I now get rid of perfumes I can't connect with. I've got a friend who also collects perfumes and he doesn't have, he's got a wife and he's got a house and he's got to pay for things and he's, he's a real person. He's got a, he's got a life. So I just give him all my designer perfumes that I don't, that I don't wear and I don't care about. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it's, it's everybody wins, but the ones that I connect to through sort of like what I've learned and how to connect to them, that's another thing I think as well with men. I think a lot of men have never learned how to, to engage with their emotional side. I think a lot of men would, but they've never been taught how. Yeah. It's one of the things, it's one of the things that, I've learned to do through perfume, through what you were saying, simply by observation and then obviously talking to you in the comments. And you well, know what? Also, you know. and also, Rich, let me tell you one more thing, which is so beautiful that we're talking about funerals and death and what perfumes to wear for funerals and that you're talking about men connecting with their emotions. You know, it's also very hard for, you know, the heterosexual normed man, you know, you're not allowed to cry. Don't show those emotions, you know. And now that we're talking about perfumes and connecting with emotions and funerals, you guys, it's okay to cry. It really is. Because guess what? Tears are not a sign of weakness. They're a sign of strength. Because it means that you're not weak. It means that you're strong enough to show your true emotions. You know how much strength it takes to take that mask off and show who you truly are to others? That takes a lot of courage and a lot of strength. And only... The true men and women out there that are really connected to themselves have that strength to take that mask off and show who they really are. Vulnerability of emotions, showing that vulnerability doesn't mean you're weak. I always say that. And on another note, what is also super fascinating that we're talking about funerals and perfumes, you know what I always say, perfumes live on our skin. You give them life when you spray them onto your skin and then they start evolving and living their life and their lifespan ends eventually, just like every, other's li every other person's life. They fade. The dry down of a perfume is the death of a perfume. And you know, when they, when they talk about the sweet smell of death, you know, I always say this, you know, the first thing that starts decomposing in a dead body are the sugars. So that's why in the initial stages of the decomposition of the body, there's a sweet, sickly sweet smell in the air. That's because the sugar starts to de start decomposing. And this is why one of the reasons why lilies are used in funeral homes, they have that similar sickly sweet smell. So it combines well with the corpse smell because it smells of flowers. And it's so poetic yeah. to me that death is actually a flower and that perfumes. This is why I wanted to make this topic like, hey, what perfumes to wear at a funeral? And might, a lot of people might say to this, oh, I would never dare wear a perfume at a funeral. I was like, and then I would be, I would counter that by telling you, well, you should wear a perfume to a funeral because perfumes are literally a, a lifespan on your skin in, in, in two, three, four. Some perfumes last 12 hours. Some perfumes last two hours on the skin. But that, just like our lives, some people are born and die immediately the next day. Some kids live to be 20. Some people live to be 100. Prince Philip lived to be 99. So the same with perfumes. Some have big longevity. Some have short longevity. But they do die on your skin. And the last breath that a perfume takes on your skin is the true last poetic key that it has to give. And remember, Mitch, Mitch, I often say this, when I want that last breath of life of a perfume on my skin, I wait till the last dry down, then I come close to my skin with my nose and I warm it up, I blow onto it with my hot air and that pops the last molecules on my skin. That smell, you guys? Yeah. And that's it. After that, you blow again, it's gone, it's dead. But that last breath of life of a perfume, I mean, nothing more than a perfume should be worn to a funeral. I'm telling you guys, this nobody dares make these topics on YouTube, but I'm so grateful that Rich Mitch came and wanted to make this topic with me because it's important to talk about this, you guys. And it's important to acknowledge the fact that we're not long for this world. <laughs> Sooner or later, we're gone too. Aisha just sent us a super chat. Thank you so much, Aisha. Aisha sent us four quid 99. It's a beautiful chat tonight, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Woo, we got the confetti rolling. On the, on the topic of crying and men crying, it's, people need to ask themselves a question. When was the last time you felt worse after crying? Oh, that's a good point, Rich. 
It never, it never happens. You always feel better after you cry. You never feel worse. You feel so liberated. Um, yeah, it's like it's like popping. It's a, it's a bad analogy, but it's like popping a huge zit. Oh yes. And you're just like you're just like get this poison out of me, and it's out. And you, even if it's even if there's you're still stuck with it there, you've got. It's an, it's open and now it's out there and sunshine is the best disinfectant. Get it out there, feel better, find people that you feel you can share with and trust. Um, I'm not advocating that you go up and just cry to strangers, although there is the there is the kindness of strangers. Sometimes it's easier for a lot of people to talk to a stranger than it is to. So if you've got people you feel you can talk to, then yeah. you are very lucky and you should and you should talk to them. Um, but if not, there are strength. There are good people. Most people are good. Um, and feel free. There are places to go and cry and talk to. Mm. Um, and it's we're, li- we're fortunate that we live in a time where these things are becoming more accessible and more and more destigmatized is probably the best word. Yeah. Where you can go. Where you can go and share these things. Mm. Do you have another perfume? Um, this is going to be my this is going to be the main one and it's a big perfume and it's a it's it's someone who feel if say if you're one of the chief mourners if you're one of if you're like if you're say if it, this is a this is a perfume for if for if a close family member dies and i mean an immediate family member and it's called ensemble's mythique mm-hmm. by Guerlain. Mm-hmm. And Ensemble's Mythique, um, much like this line, this this bottle is one of the, I don't know whether it's the art materials or the Le Paris, I think it's the Le, Paris, Le Parisiennes. Um, it's in like the, um, they're in the, like the, the, they're sort of like the B bottle bottles, but they're like, they're like um, opaque with like different colours. Yeah. And this is called Ensemble's Mythique. And what this has is, it has a massive, massive amber grey note and the amber grey in it is supported by other notes but the amber grey note itself mm-hmm. is very very you know that you know that you know what amber grey is every i'm sure everybody knows what amber grey is how it's yes how it's but, the, but for me the visual is this has spent a long time lost at sea this perfume this perfume reminds me of of standing on a shoreline on in the autumn in the winter in the cold not necessarily the dark but those short days where there's not a lot of light um it's almost eternal twilight uh, and you're staring out at the sea and the sea although it isn't forever might excuse me might as well go on forever mm-hmm. um it's got it's got supporting notes like incense and saffron and aldehydes and a bit of rose as well and um, so it's a very beautiful perfume but for me it smells like it longs for something mm-hmm. and it all but it also feels lost it's got a it's got a very it's very salty um does it have a it, gerlinad uh, dry down no mm-hmm. no it's it's quality it's girl it's girl in quality mm-hmm. but it's not girl and not it's not got it hasn't got jasmine it hasn't got vanilla mm-hmm. it hasn't got that sort of that shalimar that shalimar samsara yeah vanilla like, heavy amber vanilla yeah. olfactive story yeah, says that, yes lots of amber gris in it yeah aldehydes and amber gris so it's got this it's got this salty like longing loss like lost at sea sort of thing as if you're just as if, like it feels like a loss of hope mm. like do you know the finality of death oh like, nice like, oh i want to yeah, okay i might blind buy it is it still in production yeah i think it is i think you might have to you might have to be quick um but it's it's got that it's got a, it's got a lot of hopelessness in it to me it's i got love a lot the of... hopelessness aspect of it but you know i don't think they're using a natural ambergris it must be some ambroxon <laughs> i 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, mm. If you can get a vintage one, that's definitely got real amber green. Oh, yes, um, vintage, of course. But uh, how old is uh, this perfume? The Ensemble Mystique de Orient. The Ensemble Mystique de Orient. I'll send you a link. When was it released? Um, The original was released in 2012, but it was repackaged. Yeah, then there's no amber green in it, dude. Mm -mm. It was repackaged. 2012, already amber green got cut down and, like, butchered. I, I'm not sure if there if there's original natural amber green. I mean, might be, but... Mm. Let's have a look on this one. This one was released in 2019. Um... The roads, the Alpha, it's very salty. It's very, it's that Les Absolus de Orion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it's, that's the line it's from. And it's the same line as Santal Royale and Patchouli Ardon and Queer Entense. Yeah, Lame and Stereo. Olfactive Stories just says, yes, Ensemble Mythique uh, is still part of the Absolut d'Orient collection. I don't think Ensemble Mythique has really Ambergris, though. That's olfactive stories uh, comment. So I, I can tell you, I mean, you guys for who, you know, wants to join my channel, become a member today, tier two members get access to a special video that I posted a couple of weeks ago on Ambergris. Uh, the entire video is dedicated to the history of Ambergris and also uh, its meaning today in perfumery. So you can check that video out, you guys, if you want as well. Uh, exclusive to patrons and tier two members. Sorry, back to you, Rich Mitch. <laughs> So I was just going to say, if it isn't real ambergris, it is the great synthetic. Yeah. It is the great synthetic representation of ambergris that I've ever smelled. Mm. The vibe it gives off, the the way it's it's salty. It feels as though it's slightly. Do you know how you preserve food in salt? How the Romans used to preserve, yes. preserve food in salt. Yeah. Um, it's got that sort of perseverance through loss. It's got that. It's it's got that. Um, it's got that, it's got that desolation. Do you know when you look out onto the, into the ocean and the sea and because of the curvature of the earth, you can't see far away places. You can only see the sea meeting the horizon mm. and you can just see it and it just looks like it goes on forever. It looks like the sea goes on into space. Yes, and yes, I know exactly that. <laughs> It feels like being lost, mm. um, and it feels like it takes you back to that primal place when you're a kid mm. and something's happened, and and you need somebody to protect you. It feels like it doesn't. It's a very mature perfume, though. Um, it's the type of thing you would have to wear. I can't see somebody in their early twenties. I mean, if you want to wear it in your early twenties, then wear it in your early twenties. But It, it would take some serious gravitas mm. to do that. I mean, you're you're a good salesperson. You got everybody in the chat saying they want to order a bottle. <laughs> it is it is fantastic. I know Audrey Jane. Um, she's got a she got a bottle on me. Uh, she blind bought it on me recommendation, and uh, she wants an extra bottle now. And um... just. So, but it, because it's Ensemble Mythique, so it has incense in it, I presume. It has incense in it, but the story of the perfume is is definitely, definitely the amber grey. The incense in it has the church. It's not church incense, but it's very, it's very dusty. Oh, I like it's that. Very, I see, yeah. It's very It's, yeah, it has got some warmth. Velasquez says that still on Sans Mystique had some warmth. It does have some warmth as well. Mm. Um, there's like a little, there's a little, you know how hope springs eternal and there's life and death. Yeah. Um, it's, it's got that as well. There is because there's rose in it. So there's a little bit of sweetness. I mean, the tiniest bit of sweetness. Mm. Um, and it's, it's got this, it's, it's got this. Like it's, it's it's more of a loss, like a detached sort of smell. So it's it's got this. If you were one of the chief mourners, if if this was somebody sitting in the front row of a funeral, yeah, in front of often close family members, then yes, um, yes, that would be this would be something you could wear and get away with. Miss Marie says, "Forever Sorry. Amber Gris is a 1960s episode of Popeye the Sailor." While babysitting Sweet Pea, Popeye tells him the story of where Olive's perfume comes from. 
Oh, that's amazing. I have to see this episode right away. Um, uh, Olfactive Story says, Ensemble Mythique is my favorite from this collection. Velasquez says, yeah, there's a little incense in there. Akira says, it's really cool, dusty, powdery, and arrogant rose. <laughs> yeah, the rose. The rose has popped up as though it's got no right to be there. Um, the rose is there. The rose is there to sort of, you imagine like a child at a funeral. Um, say that great great grandmother's died, and the child never really knew the great great grandmother, and probably won't remember them when they get older. Yeah. But they're a little shining light at the funeral. They're all happy, and they're just there's just everybody there, hmm. and everybody's like around, and the child's just running around, and they're oblivious to what's happened. That's what the rose is like in this perfume. It's it's hmm. like a little shining light. It's a little bit of hope. Oh man, uh, that sounds amazing. Very poetic, you know. Because in my selection. I also have an incense, but mine is very down to earth incense, church, straightforward. It's like I chose um, Comme des Garçons Avignon. Um, yes. And I and you know why I did that? I know this is a simple one. It's not as complex, probably from your description. This one is not at all complex as is Ensemble Mythique by Guerlain. But I chose Avignon. Let me smell it now. Uh, because there's something very churchy about it, but not dirty, powdery, dusty, churchy, but rather elevated. Almost as if I would like to wear this at a funeral where I want to feel like this sort of ritual of saying my last goodbye to this person through the funeral... Uh, is almost like this smell helps me elevate that person, almost like makes me feel, this smells to me of parting, a departure, and having that, you know, this is really difficult for me because I'm not a church person, <laughs> you know, I'm not religious that way. No, no, no. It's but like I am... That's what the church is for, isn't it? It's it's for hope. It's for the future. It's to, it's it's togetherness. It's that you're not alone in this moment. It's that this person, what it meant to you, it's a celebration sort of vibe. Sort of vibe, um, except, you know, the church is a whole other can of worms. But it, more than church, it's the community, you know? It's like, let's say, forget about the church and religion for a second. And uh, let's say in our community, nobody's religious, but a very dear person died. We still have our, our own traditions of how to unify together and how to bury that person and how to say our goodbye. This particular perfume, uh, Avignon, smells of an elevation. And it it almost comforts me while I have to say goodbye for the last time to that person, knowing that I will never hear them laugh again, never hear them talk again. It's that void, it's that complete and utter silence that envelops you once a dear person passes away. You know you will never hear them again. And that, that when my father passed away, I understood that for the first time in my life. I felt that complete. It's a, it's a silence. You, you, if you try to imagine silence, you, you know, silence has a, a, a sound, actually. Silence has sound. There's atmospheric sound in silence. But it's a different type of silence when a parent dies. It is absolute. And it is something that sucks everything you have, just it's, drowns you. It's a silence that drowns you. And Avignon is a perfume that elevates you from that drowning. It, it allows you to not drown. And so that's why um, this is one of, this is my incense for a funeral, because <laughs> it kind of helps you too. It helps you envision that person that has passed away kind of like elevated, but it helps you also, it helps you yourself not drown in that whole concept because Avignon is not a heavy incense like the church incense would be. It suffocates you. As beautiful as church incense is, it's a dry mofo. This one yeah. has a bit of sweet elevation in it. And that's why I love it so much. So that would be my number two. Wait, did you show three or four already? I think my I've done Chanel number five, Claire de Russe, Paul and Moi Puff from an Ensemble Mythique. Oh, so you did four. You did four. Okay, so let me do one more. So I'm, I'm at three then. Oh, no, I did La Pausa also. Well, let me do one more. Pour Monsieur. This is a really quick one. 
Pour Monsieur is very out of egotistical reasons because Pour Monsieur Eau de Toilette only. It's a very light, soothing Shepra. Elegant, classy. It's in nobody's nose. It is just the right amount of citrusy, but also sweet. The cardamom, ginger, and uh, labdanum in there. And then that oak moss blended with sandalwood a little bit. It, it, it's a magical perfume. Very poised. Very elegant. This is the type of perfume we wear to a funeral where not necessarily a family member has passed away, but somebody that you respect a lot from the from friends or family of friends, you know, close relatives of your best friend. This is what you wear to be respectful to others while smelling to yourself of something soothing and relaxing. So this is definitely a perfume I would recommend to wear to a funeral and you want to come across as very respectful towards the family of the person who has passed away. So there, that's that. <laughs> What's your next one? Um, well, I was going to go with something, but I've actually had a thought. Um, say something terrible happened and you passed away. What perfume would you want to be buried in? Oh, like I perfume uh, on my yeah. dead uh, carcass. Um I'm very, I actually, this sounds very macabre, but you know, I love my horror movies. I would be very fascinated to know how my decomposing body smells like in the beginning. When I was, I was talking about this in a um, couple of minutes ago when we were talking about lilies. And I said, uh, when the body starts decomposing, the first the first thing that decomposes in the body are the sugars. So the decay begins with a sweet smell of death. And I wonder how that sweetness would translate on my skin. So in the in the beginning stages of my death, I would really want to I would want to have a perfume. This sounds super macabre, but I would like to have a perfume of my decomposing sugars in my body. For the beginning, I would like to have my own perfume, like my own. How do I smell like my, you know, my own smell would be my perfume. But in the advanced stages of decay, when I'm about to get buried, where that sugar is gone, I would probably. Oh, gosh, I, I don't know. I would have to go with Chanel number no. five, probably just because I know it so well. Um, and it's an it's abstract enough for me to guide me to the other wherever the other place might be. What about you? Um, if I died, I would want them to spray Drakkar Noir on us because that's the only way that I would ever have it, that I, that I would ever allow it to be put on us. So they would just have to make sure I was dead by spraying Drakkar Noir on us. <laughs> so like, if we are alive, we would wake up and run. <laughs> that's exactly right. If I was alive, I'd be like, oh God, what are you doing? Get off. <laughs> Oh man, Rich, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make sure I'm dead, put Drakkar Noir on us. If oh. I respond, then you know that I'm not a. Then you know that I'm not dead. So Drakkar um, Noir, almost as a resuscitating perfume. <laughs> like, like, like smelling salts. Yes. Um, if I was to be serious about what I would like, um, probably Amber Sultan. Um, Ambra Sultan by Serge Luton. It's an amber. Mm -hmm. It's a spicy amber. It's just it's it's it was the first niche perfume that I smelled that showed me what perfume could really be. All those things we've talked about today about emotions mm -hmm. and and the quality and the and what perfume can do for you as a person. Mm -hmm. Ambra Sultan was the first one that took me to that next level to show me what like the art of perfumery could be. Mm -hmm. um, so it would probably be that and for sentimental reasons as yeah. well. I mean, I'm thinking also like, I'm not so sure. I mean, there's one more that I would maybe want to be buried in, but I didn't want to say it because it's my last one to wear to a funeral as well. <gasps> Go on then. And this is a shocker, you guys, because... Only in its vintage first formulation form. I don't want no reformulations of this one. This one has to be worn in its old school way. And it's shocking because it's not an easy one. And it's shocking because, yeah, you would steal the show at that funeral. But to me, 
And by the way, a lot of you were shocked when I made my list of like um, top 10 perfumes for the end of the world. You all thought I was going to put this one in the list and I didn't. Now you're going to find out why that perfume didn't make it. Poison by Christian Dior. The Eau de Toilette, actually. Um, is it going to focus? This is the first, first batch ever made. The old school uh, bottle. Um, anyway, so... Um, I would not take this to the island, uh, end of the world perfumes because it smells of death. And I would want, if I'm living alone somewhere uh, and I have to save only 10 perfumes, I want all of the perfumes to be of something to look forward to the future. Poison to me is the most beautiful smell of decay. It is just wonderful. <laughs> the opoponax in here uh, is, and the plum, plum and the opoponax, tuberose as well, but it, this is not for me the tuberose perfume. This is, the Opoponax uh, Ilang Ilang Plum Perfume. And it goes so heavy, dark, creamy, almost rotting, smelling of rot. This, to me, is the conceptual funeral perfume, okay? And I, I know that only in my mind, this is the perfect funeral perfume. In real life, you would not be able to pull this one off because it's quite offensive, to get to a funeral home and like everything starts smelling of you. <laughs> so, but conceptually speaking, this is the ideal fragrance for a funeral, in my humble opinion. The Eau de Toilette of Poison by Christian Dior from 1986. And yes, I would also be buried in this. This one also, it, it, wear this to be buried in perfection. That's what? right, I got... um. I helped Audrey Jane get a vintage bottle of that. Or a more vintage bottle of that. Not necessarily from the 80s. But, but would you... Oh, Audrey. Audrey Jane just sent us a super chat. Thank you so much, Audrey. Really fantastic and informative chat. Hats off, chaps. Super chat from Audrey Jane. Chaps. Really fantastic and informative off. chat. Hats off, chaps. <laughs> Bubbles the bot read the comment. Woo! We got the confetti. So wait, Rich. But what do you think about poison as a funeral perfume? Is it too crazy? Conceptually. I think if people couldn't put up with the fact that you wore something like poison as a corpse, then there's something wrong with the audience. Because I believe that funerals are for the living. No, um, no, no. I mean, no, no. I, like, you no, going to a funeral wearing it. Oh, me going to a funeral. Do I think uh, it would depend? It would depend who you were um, mm -hmm. uh, in relation to the dead person yeah. or in, in relation to the dead person's family. And it would depend on how much you put on as well. Oh, for, for, for sure. Uh, but I mean, the honest. smell of it, the actual poison as perfume, do you see it connected to death? Yes. Ah, good. Okay, that's what I wanted totally to know. Connect, so it's totally say connected to death. Um, it's, let you say, that plum, um, it's, it's, because plums are dark fruit, and it's mm. dark and sweet, and like you were talking about, like, sugars. Yeah. Um, Sort of, it's sort of it's it's I like juxtaposition in fragrance, and I like I like juxtaposition in the wearing of fragrance. Say um, say that's why you wear that's why you wear light um, airy things when it's hot, and you wear cold you wear like warming things when it's cold because you're trying to find a balance. And I like that contrast. Um, I think that for me the the equivalent of wearing. What, what you're saying about poison, um, for me, would be Koros. Oh, why if, yourself? If I, was to, if I was to wear Koros, because Koros has got that sort of... Koros has got that, and Antaeus as well. I know they shouldn't really be... They shouldn't really... But Antaeus is obviously of the earth. Antaeus is very earthy. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Antaeus is very earthy, and it's got that... It's got that oak moss. It's got that... It's got that civet. It's got that ground sort of smell, um, and there it is. Look, <laughs> you know, I got them all around me. I live surrounded by perfumes. Um, Koros has got that. Koros is. I think Koros is a bit too bombastic um, for a funeral, but I think Antaeus, because it's much more well behaved, um, because it's much more refined, because it's not as outrageous. Um, it would all depend because let's be honest, sometimes you just go to a funeral to make sure that person's dead. Oh, um, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
sometimes you want to wear something big and horrible. Um, it's, it's, um, it's, like, is it it's, an open casket funeral? Is it an open casket? I want to make uh, sure the bitch is dead. <laughs> exactly, that's right. Sometimes you just want to make sure they're dead, you know? I mean, obviously you wouldn't say that to the family. Um, no, yeah. But, but, you know, some people... You've just got to, like, you know, just have a quick look over. Yeah, yeah, they're dead. Yeah, that's not a problem anymore. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, you could wear what you want, I suppose, in that case. It depends if you wanted to go undercover. It sort of speaks to the to the point I was making about um, funerals being for the living. Yeah, for sure. It, uh, it's a comforting uh, thing for the living. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, for me, as somebody who's not religious, that's, that's how I perceive funerals. Um, I went to a, my grandmother's funeral about um, about six years ago, and it was the first funeral of a close family member I'd had. And I was there, and I was wondering how I would react, and I didn't react until we got to the graveside, and it was time to leave. And it felt all of a sudden, all of it, because I'd watched her die, like I'd been going up to see her every day at the hospital. I had to sign the forms about resuscitation. Um, there was, there was a lot of stuff as like a 25, as like a, like a, like a man in his late twenties had to do, um, Mm -hmm. I had to do that. And, and, and and I felt the funeral was for the benefit of my mother, whose mother it was who had died. And I felt the funeral was for the benefit of other people and the other people who had known her. And I got solace from that. I didn't necessarily get solace from the preacher saying, oh, she's going to heaven, Richard, don't worry about it. I was like, all right, yeah, no problem. Um, I just sort of felt like for the other people in my family, and that's what that's what these funeral rites are for, they're for the living, so that they get the chance to say goodbye. It's, a, it's, something, to, it's something to remember. Um, and I suppose funerals are, ha- are better having funerals than not having funerals. Yes, it gives closure in some way. It gives you closure. It allows you to embrace moving on as well with your life in a way, in certain ways. It's the end. It's the it's the beginning. Of, it's the end of the beginning of the of the grieving process. It's the beginning. And, it's the beginning of the grieving process. You mean? Yeah, it's the end of the beginning. Oh um, yes, the, well, correct. Yeah, right. I gotcha. The, well, dying, and then the lead up to the funeral, and then the burial, the burying of that person. That's the end of the beginning. Then you've got to go through. Then you've got to go through the stages of grief. You've got to. You've got to come to terms with it, and that can take years. That can take lifetimes, depending on who it is, depending on the circumstances. Mm-hmm. Um, if if somebody has lost a child, that that doesn't end. Um, that's with people for a long time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it's all about circumstance. That's why different perfumes for different funerals, I thought, was a good idea. Because there are so many different... It's all about context. It's all about context. And it's all about your own mood. Because you might have planned out you know, perfectly well, oh, the funeral is in two days. I'm going to wear this outfit. I'm going to wear this perfume. But you never know. Because in two days' time, you might wake up that morning before the funeral in a totally different state of mind. And all of a sudden, you're going to change your mind about the perfume you wanted to wear. And you're going to go for something totally different. Because, and I'm talking about us people who love perfume so much. So we've smelled hundreds of them. You know, there are some people, I can't believe it, but there are some people who have literally only smelled two perfumes their whole life. And that's all they wear. But yes. for us who know hundreds of them, and I mean, to me, I go through... 10, 20 different perfumes a day. You know, I rotate. You know, I, even if I don't spray them on, I'm just going to smell them out of the bottle because I need them to surround or, or frame a certain moment of the day. So I would, on the day of the funeral, I might even take three perfumes with me in my bag because I still don't know really quite exactly what I will spray on right before I enter the church or wherever the ceremony is going to be taking place because. I feel like flexibility is also very important in this case um, to go with your mood and and allow your mood to also swing and and feel yourself in that moment. And if that moment tells you, hey, you know what? I wanted to wear uh, Ensemble Mythique, but I'm actually feeling more on right now. Okay, fine. I got the bottle with me. Let me spray that on instead. 
<laughs> I, you know, I think, you, I mean, I don't know, maybe we should be more strict with this, but if it's a funeral of a person that you love, I think it's very important to wear the right perfume in that moment. If it's the funeral of somebody you don't care for, but you're doing it out of respect to the other person's family, maybe you could tone it down, you know, wear something like Pau Monsieur, which is a classic standard, works with, well with everything, no questions asked. Uh, but as you said, all depends on the moment, I guess. Uh, on the funeral, on the context, sorry, you said context. All right, you guys. Well, I think... Uh, do you have any more on your list? Or are we through with no, the list? Nothing. I'm, I'm all out. Me too. Well, you guys, this was Rich, Mitch, and Dacob giving you our <laughs> rundown of perfumes for funerals. And at, as it turns out, also perfumes we would wear in our own caskets uh, when we kick the bucket. But um, <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you have, uh, please do uh, thumb it up. And uh, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I would tell you to follow Rich Mitch, but Rich Mitch specifically told me he don't got no social media. <laughs> right, Rich? <laughs> That's right. That's right. I would say my YouTube channel, but I don't post any videos, so... Sorry, you should people. start, though, because you have a wonderful way with words, my dear. You should start. And even if you don't want to show your face, you could just do uh, something like uh, podcast style, you know? I've thought about podcasts before, I must admit. Yeah, and you guys, if you can't find Rich Mitch because he doesn't do Instagram and all that shebang, you can find him lurking about in other perfume videos of other perfume channels. Just look for the rubber ducky and you know Rich Mitch is in the house because he does leave his mark and a wonderful mark that is. Let me just say that. <laughs> so Mr. Rich Mitch, thank you so much for tuning in and calling in to the fashion bunker. It really means the world to me. And I'm so happy that we managed to touch base on such an important topic together. Thank you very much for having us. It's been my pleasure, absolutely. So I hopefully we can do this again sometime. Anytime, we can send famous Shakespeare characters or something strange like that. I'll be so amazing. <laughs> All right, thank <laughs> you so much, Rich. And you guys, thank, thank you. you so oh, thank you. And thank you guys for tuning in and watching. Uh, you can subscribe to my channel, but also push the join button next to the subscription button. Become a member today and gain access to extra perks, including being listed. Look at this, all your names, your wonderful names scrolling here at the end credits bar as co-producers of the Fashion Bunker. But you also gain access to exclusive videos that don't come to YouTube, as well as special emojis that you get to use in our live chats. So what can I tell you? This is, I think, uh, one of the most important topics when it comes to perfumes life and death, because perfumes are exactly that, a symbology and a unity, also sometimes a distinct separation between the two. But after all is said and done, on your skin, once you spray a perfume, you give it life, it evolves, it blends with your own chemistry, with your own essential oils, and then after a certain while, it slowly starts fading away until it dies. So, the French might call an orgasm la petit mort, the small death, but I call perfumes the small death. And I use perfumes also as a training ground to embracing and accepting the fact that sooner or later we are also going to die because we are, we're perishable goods, you guys. And that's all it is at the end of the day. And perfumes give me solace in accepting and embracing that part of life, which is also death. So Rich Mitch, any last words from you as well before we kick the bucket in this video? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for having us on. It's, um... It's been my pleasure, my honor. All right. Pleasure and honor all mine. Until next time, you guys, never forget to never give up on love. Love you all. See you soon. Take care. Bye. Mwah.